there, gang. Gonna pick up right where we left off two weeks ago now, due to some severe internet issues, and do a little bit of light sanding on the ES-330. Um, there are times when you're trying to match a base color like this uh, on a new patch, and if there's any overspray using a tinted finish like this, um, you're basically adding extra color onto the color that you're trying to match. Uh, right around the patch here, and you can see it sort of a darker hemisphere. Um, what's nice about using the airbrush and sort of a light touch with it is the finish is sort of atomized, sprays in a kind of a particulate way that um, it's almost like dust when it lands on the surface. And so it doesn't really melt deeply into the previous surface. Like if I laid into it with you know a really heavy coat, um, it would melt the previous lacquer significantly and mix with it. But because I had a light touch, I can come back and sort of sand off most of this halo and end up with something that's sort of less obvious. So, that's what I'm doing. Then it's time for several coats of clear. Turning to the Gretsch 6119 now, I need to mix up a reddish brown for the back of the headstock. Maybe it's more of a brownish red. There's no recipe for this stuff, you just basically have to mix it until it looks right. And we'll spray several successive coats. Getting the sides as well. My airbrush technique is based more on the work of H.R. Giger than, you know, your typical woodworking stuff. I, I kind of fake it when it comes to grain and things. Cleaning off the front surface with some denatured alcohol. Here I'm applying some liquid frisket, which is a fine art stopping fluid is the other name for it. It's made with natural gum rubber and it acts as an easily removable masking material. It's sticky. It's not easy to apply in these confined areas. Uh, I'm using it mostly as a positioning aid for scraping, um, just to give me some indication of where the pearl is, because it's all going to be covered in black. And I don't want to really scrape off in areas where there's no pearl. <laughs> so here you can see on the little tiny letters. I'm just dabbing tiny dots. I find this stuff, um, as soon as you go over it again, it sort of picks up the previous layer and it all comes off in a big stringy mess. So I'm just making little dots along the line of each letter. This is a densely pigmented model makers lacquer from Tamiya, the model making company. It's the right color for headstock facings. I use it a lot for Gibsons, but it also works for Gretsch. After that coat of black has a chance to dry, I have to go back and rediscover the inlay, as it were. The frisket helps a bit, but it's still a slow process to find the forms in there and not scrape past them into the bare wood. I'm using a tiny chisel as a scraper here. You can see the surface is pretty gnarly. I didn't want to sand right back to bare wood. I just took off the high spots because the perloid in this is really quite thin. I didn't measure it, but it's probably only half a millimeter. So I'm going to rely on eight or 10 coats of clear on top to give me enough thickness to level out. Here I'm matching the aged color in the perloid with um, an alcohol based marker, a yellow. I think that matches up pretty well. Well, now let's work on a base. It's been a little while. Here we have a 1977 Fender Music Master. It's going to get a new pickup and a new pickguard. Should be fun. Let's talk about the Music Master, because it might not be as well known as some of the other models. It's a budget-oriented product of the 70s. Uh, it's kind of a bare-bones take on the Mustang bass, really, which was itself kind of the budget model of the late 60s. These were made between 1971 and 81. It's a short scale, 30-inch uh, bass, 
Bodies are made of poplar or alder, so they tend to be fairly light, comfy. Uh, rosewood board. It's got the two saddle bridge and a single pickup. Now this is a product of the let's use up all our spare parts era that Fender went through because you know the bodies are actual leftover Mustangs and this pickup they put a six pull piece guitar pickup in here rather than a four pull piece bass pickup which is pretty gutsy I mean it's got a sealed cover so you wouldn't know but still the, the exec who signed off on that had no shame right the Music Master was inexpensive and it came along at around the same time as punk rock so a lot of punk bands had one and a lot of them got modified with different pickups and electronics. You know, they've always been a bit more affordable than some of the other Fender basses, so it was a good platform for experimentation. So that's essentially what we're going to be doing. We're going to be installing a TV Jones Thunder Blade. That means we're going to have to route the body a little bit to fit and make a new pick guard and put in some different pots. Fairly straightforward work, but as always, you know, we want to take some care and attention while we're doing it. As it arrives, the action looks just a little bit high. And just over 7 64ths on the bass side. And just about the same on the treble. And it could be a little bit of extra relief in the neck than is necessary. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, I think the truss rod could use adjustment. Up around 23, 24 thousandths relief. Which is about well, it's more than twice what it should be. The tuners are a bit stiff and could probably do with some lubrication. This has got the top loader bridge. Uh, not the most esteemed fender creation. Also, there's a great propensity to really mess up the finish back here, so a piece of plastic when you're unstringing or stringing. Um, the finish on this guitar was probably originally white, but it's aged into this kind of nice creamy yellowish sort of color. We'll remove all the screws. No, I don't keep them in order on a specially prepared piece of tape. Their patina is all pretty similar in this case. Electronics, and these are all nicely self-contained on the pick guard, except for the bridge ground. While the soldering iron heats up, let's have a look at that pickup with its six pole pieces. And the electronics components, I'm willing to bet this has had a mod or two at some point. That um, tone pot looks younger than the others. There are two caps in play here coming off both lugs and um, well just looking at the way this ground wire is uh, connected I would suggest that that's not factory original or maybe it is that'd be sad I'll go ahead and pull off the bridge ground the tone pot seems to be a CTS from 2006 that's 18 years ago now folks That pot also had a couple of pretty thick hardware store washers on it, too. Always take an extra second and put the screws back on the pickup. Because if you don't, it, they will certainly go missing. And you'll have a fun time trying to find new ones. There. Just saved someone an hour of searching. Four-ply tortoise. And it's big enough. You know, it's practically impossible to make an accurate reproduction of a pick guard without a template. Especially one that's got a chamfered edge on it, it's angled. Um, you know, it just, it takes a long time to make one of these up, and I might never actually use this again, but it's the only way I'm going to make sure that all of the screw holes line up properly and that everything's in the right place. I'm going to super glue it in place on the 
now rough cut piece of new plastic. Yeah, it doesn't really matter how close you get the vacuum hose. You're going to be picking this stuff out of your hair, your underwear, your oatmeal, everything for the next month or so. Little tiny shavings of plastic. <laughs> Drilling holes for the potentiometer shafts and the jack. Hey, all the holes line up. How did that happen? Yes, I know the plastic is still on it. I've got more work to do. Hold your horses. I want to make sure this goes in the right spot. Don't want it there because it runs afoul of the screw hole. So we'll push it this way a little bit. Um, probably right around there, I imagine. Which would be approximately 90 millimeters from the end of the last fret. Okay, I can do that. Okay, we've got some tape on there. We've got to find a center line for this neck. So I'm going to scribe down both sides. Project it with a ruler. All right, I'm going to make a routing template that will allow me to do both the cutout and the pick guard and the cavity below. And to do that, I have to take some careful measurements. Um, especially in pickups with metal covers that are soldered onto the base plate. Sometimes during the manufacturing, there can be odd stresses and such that um, cause bulges and things to form. So the sides might not be completely perpendicular. In this case, we've got exactly 34 millimeters across on this side, and it's almost 34 and a half on that side. So it's the kind of thing I have to take into consideration. The other thing I want to do is take a look at the radius on the corners, and it would be nice if it's half inch, because that's your sort of standard pattern making router bit diameter, and it is. That's good. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they'll be three-eighths of an inch or even quarter. And uh, you end up with a template that you have to either cut out with a file or you end up with great big gaps around the corners of your pickup, which can look kind of weird. But in this case, it's half inch, which is nice. The other thing you might want to ascertain is does the pickup flare at the bottom where it meets the base plate? which is often the case because of the uh, the molds that they're pressed into. And in this case, yes, there is quite a significant little gap between the um, caliper and sort of the top edge of the pickup versus the bottom. So this is probably a millimeter wider at the base than it is halfway up. And uh, in that case, I might want to make the template slightly narrower in the base measurement, so that I'm not going to have a great big gap all the way around. Which again can look kind of cheesy depending on how you do it. Got a bunch of pieces of plywood, just making sure that my measurements were accurate. And I'll glue those all up together with a whole bunch of clamps. Here I'm planing what's going to be a filler piece that will make up the difference between the uh, hole that's going to be in the body versus the one that's appearing in the pick guard. So I'll glue that in. So yeah, that's a good snug fit for the pickup. I'll pull those out again when I want to route the body. So the template gets super glued to the pick guard with tape between. And I'll set the router to just cut through it. That produces a nicely sized hole. I'll go back and remove those um, spacer strips. And then glue it to the body producing the hole there, which is slightly wider and longer than the pickup, and just deep enough so that it'll be about flush with the pick guard when it's completely sunk in there. Always a good idea to check to make sure that the screws aren't long enough to come out the other side. That would be annoying. I'm just using the tips of the screws to make a position mark so I can come back with a drill 
make pilot holes. I'll mimic Fender's practice by putting some foil tape on the area of the pick guard around the electronics. Okay, working on the wiring. It's a fairly simple scheme, obviously, just being one volume, one tone. TV Jones is suggesting using 500k pots uh, for this pickup, which might be a little bit out of the ordinary for a bass. Um, however, Gibson used a number of 500k schemes in the 60s, so I looked up one of those. And um, it's going to be kind of a hybrid, you know. We've got the um, sort of jumper capacitor, which works as kind of like a, a tempering agent before the signal even hits the, the tone pot. It's a 0.01k. And then for the actual pot, the control, it's a, a 47k, which, um, you know, is again sort of a hybrid mix between the two. But I think they're looking for a kind of a rounded, slightly warmer tone, you know, given that this is a single pickup bass and the pickup is, it's um, sort of not in the neck position, it's farther towards the bridge. So we're looking for versatility. I think this should do. The knobs for this have a set screw, and I only had split shaft 500k pots on hand, but I do have these lovely little brass bushings which take up the space and make it a perfect fit. Some foam under the pickup to give it some bounce and uh, allow you to adjust the height. Here's the neck, which I took off to adjust the truss rod. You can see there's a whole bunch of QC stamps on there. The frets were in pretty good shape overall. They could use a bit of a polish. Turning our attention to the sticky tuners, I'll unscrew the gears. What often happens is that the old lubricant and wear on the rather broad surfaces there can add a bunch of resistance and it gets quite dirty. So I'll clean and then very lightly lube them up with some white lithium grease. Just a bit on all the sides and put the gear back in place, which can be kind of tricky sometimes. Then a tiny drop of light machine oil on the bearing surfaces of the shaft, both top and bottom. Okay, I think that turned out pretty spiffy. It's a nice combination of colors. It's all set up. Uh, I should say I conferred with the customer because he brought me another bass at the same time, which I didn't film. And it also had pretty high action by most people's standards. And he said, oh, no, 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 don't lower it very much. That's the height it needs to be. And I was immediately remembering a story Evan Gluck tells. Evan is New York guitar repair and a very proficient bassist. And he once set up John Patitucci's bass to normal specs and was strenuously rebuffed because some bassists just need super high action to function with their technique. Everyone's different. So this is like 664 fourths across the board. Anyway, with a short scale, it's not difficult to play at all. It's actually very comfy, and I'm kind of fond of it. Bearing in mind that I'm not a bassist, I don't have a bass amp, I will try and make some sounds with it. Okay, back to the 330. I'll do some light leveling of the surface with some 1200 grit and 2400 grit. Just sanding off little bumps or orange peel. And a bit of a rub with some buffing compound. I'll go in with some tweezers and retrieve the hidden jack which has been lurking inside this whole time. As the guitar came, it didn't have a washer under the nut, which might have exacerbated the problem, so I'm adding one. I'll put the nut on there and get that tightened down. 
Okay, I think that passes the 27 and 3 quarter inch eyeball test. Uh, this guitar has lots of playware, mojo, um, surface checking, etc. So it's not out of place. Did a little work on the intonation, plugged it in, and was getting an intermittent situation with the uh, volume knob for the bridge pickup, which is not cool. So I reached in there to make sure there was nothing loose, at which point it became non-intermittent in a bad way. And uh, I guess that means I'm going to be fighting with these things through the F-hole for a period of time, um, which I'm not going to film. I uh, The pot's this pot, in particular, is extremely corroded looking. I went in there with a the little mirror, so I don't know. We'll see if we can salvage it. Um, other than that, I'm just going to plug in and you can hear the warm tones of the mini bucker in the neck. And we'll call it a day. <laughs> 